Hello, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, MIT Sloan Alumni Online brings you the latest breaking news, cutting-edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty and alumni. Today, we're pleased to have Bryn Panay Burkhart with us again for the second in our three-part series, career series, Leveraging LinkedIn for Effective Career Management. Bryn is the Senior Associate Director of Alumni Career Services here at MIT Sloan. Bryn provides Sloan alumni with career guidance and coaching, including job search strategy, LinkedIn, networking, and salary negotiation. Bryn came to Sloan in 2006 and has been our dedicated alumni career coach since 2012. Bryn finds reward in helping a diverse range of professionals at various stages of their careers to clarify their strengths and goals, cultivate their professional brand, and position themselves to manage their careers successfully. Bryn holds a BA in journalism from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an EDM in higher education from Harvard University's Graduate School of Education. Bryn, it's great to have you with us today, and now I will turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Kathy. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be back for part two of our three-part career series. Um, so thank you for joining us. Now my goal this evening is to help you understand the importance of LinkedIn as it pertains to your career management strategy. And then we are also going to talk about how to optimize your profile in a way that positions you effectively for your career goals. Now if you were with us last month, you might recall that in that webinar, it was entitled Navigating Your Career at Any Age and Stage, we talked about how to define your core competencies, your strengths, and speak about them in a concise, compelling way, as well as how to define your values and your priorities at this given age and stage that you're at. So these two things, as I said last month, and I'm telling you about this because it's going we're building on that this month, those two things, knowing what you bring to the table, as well as knowing what is important to you at this moment in time, lay the groundwork for you to begin to position yourself professionally with intention and with purpose. And as I always tell people, my goal for everyone is intentional, purposeful career management. Okay. So we talked about that last month and we ended by talking about how to craft a career narrative or a story or a pitch that can help you move forward. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to get a little bit more tactical. We're going to go from last month's strategic session to a more tactical session and talk about how to apply that career narrative that we talked about last month effectively on LinkedIn. Because LinkedIn is, in essence, a platform for storytelling, and I'll show you that this evening. So I want to begin with the premise that when used optimally, LinkedIn can be an absolute game changer for you in terms of how you manage your career, primarily for two reasons. So the first reason is that it provides an incredibly powerful platform for you to connect with others and both build and manage your professional network. There are no more Rolodexes. Do you remember the days when you'd have these huge Rolodexes on your desk? With LinkedIn, you don't need that anymore. It is your virtual Rolodex. But second, and perhaps more importantly, LinkedIn is a rich resource for companies and exec search forms who are looking to hire talent and it enables them to effectively identify talent. So we know that companies of all sizes, from small startups to large Fortune 500 uh, firms, are using LinkedIn effectively to source talent. And in fact, the majority of LinkedIn's revenue two-thirds of their revenue, so that's huge, 65% of their revenue, comes from their corporate clients that pay LinkedIn to use what's called their talent solutions tool, which is essentially a way for them to be able to look at, the link, to look at LinkedIn profiles and use them to source both passive and active talent. Now, when I say passive talent, what I mean by that most people in LinkedIn, as long as you're not completely locking down your privacy settings, and we will discuss privacy settings at the end tonight, but most LinkedIn users are not actively job seeking. So those are considered passive talent. 
However, I always say to people, you know, if you optimize your profile, which is what we're going to discuss tonight, you then increase your chances of coming up in those recruiter searches or those searches done by, by their talent solutions clients. And I always think it's a great idea to get a sense of your market value. So when you get tapped by recruiters or companies, have that conversation, and it allows you to just kind of gauge the marketplace. So what we want to do tonight is talk about how to optimize your profile to increase your chances of coming up in searches that might be done. So having a strong LinkedIn profile is integral, really, to your career management strategy. And for those of you who might be job seeking, I'd say it's absolutely critical. So let's take a look at LinkedIn today. So LinkedIn is only 15 years old. As of last, I think it was August, they hit the half billion mark in terms of LinkedIn members. That is extraordinary growth for such a young company. The website, their website actually says that two new members join every second. It is incredibly international in scope. As you'll see here, most of the members are outside of the U.S., and that's because, um, as I heard from one product manager at LinkedIn last year, he said, you know, we pretty much covered and saturated the white-collar U.S. workforce. So most of their growth now is global in scale. LinkedIn is available in 24 languages and in over 200 countries and territories. Um, I'll point out that there's 20 million company pages on LinkedIn. We're not going to get to really dive into the tonight, but I think it's important to mention because 20 million company pages, this is an opportunity for companies to brand themselves and to engage with followers, but also for you as a LinkedIn user, you're able to go to these company pages see who you might know or who you might be connected to that works at that company, and then use the company page as a, for, as a source of information gathering or maybe even to do a little competitive intelligence. Um, there's 167 industries, I just counted the other day, I've got 150 plus here, on LinkedIn. All, most of the Fortune 500 companies are LinkedIn clients. All of the Fortune 100 companies are LinkedIn clients. And I'll tell you a short story about why I became so obsessed with LinkedIn. I've been teaching this workshop in various forms because LinkedIn evolves constantly um, since about 2014. And that's because I was moderating an MIT Sloan Alumni Club presentation in Washington, D.C. back in 2014. And there was a career panel with people who do executive hires or experienced hire talent. And at that club presentation, a woman was from Northrop Grumman, and she is the manager of talent acquisition at, at Northrop Grumman. And she told the entire room that her company was paying LinkedIn $5 million a year to source up to VP level talent. I guess anything after that, they were using retained search firms. And I remember at the time, I and mean, it was almost, well, it was four years ago, I was floored by that number. And I thought, there's got to be something to this. Now I know, many years later, there are companies that pay double that uh, to be able to, to access LinkedIn. So I think it's just important for you, in terms of your context, to understand how powerful this tool is in terms of moving um, or at least getting you on the radar in terms of the market and how your, your market value might be and how you might show up in the market for people who are using LinkedIn to source talent. Um, and then finally, one last stat and then we'll move on. There are 29,000 university or college pages that have been created on LinkedIn. Both MIT and MIT Sloan have school pages. Um, if we have time tonight, I'm going to show you a fantastic alumni tool that can be found on these pages where you can literally look at people on LinkedIn who have MIT Sloan under their education section, that's where it pulls from, and you can then slice and dice those people by where they live, where they work, what they do, or even a keyword. It's absolutely fabulous. So we'll try and get to that too. So I want to start, uh, well, I've started already. I want to continue by just talking about your connections. So LinkedIn says when you are thinking about who to connect to professionally, who should be your first degree connections? The most powerful connections typically come from four areas. The first is your family and your friends. Now, I know this is a professional networking platform. It's not Facebook, right? But the truth is 
is that your family and your friends, or your trusted family and friends, rather, are going to have professional connections. And chances are they would be more than happy to tee up introductions to any connections that they have. So it is okay, if you're thinking about this in terms of a networking um, tool, to connect with your family and friends on LinkedIn. Second, shared work experiences for obvious reasons, right? These are people who know you, who trust you, who admire your work and would likely go to bat for you. So you want to have trusted uh, shared work experiences or former or current colleagues on as your LinkedIn connections. Third is community connections. So people that you might live, live near in the same community. You might um, worship with them or play sports with them or their kids might go to your kids' schools. So people that you just know from the community or the volunteer experiences that you have. And then lastly, it's your alumni connection. So alumni experiences, those people that went to school with you, who know you, are oftentimes very valuable LinkedIn connections to call upon. So know that when you're thinking about it. Now, in the office where I sit, the Career Development Office, we are always saying to our students, build your network before you need it. Because businesses and careers are built on relationships. And your ability, your network actually, your network is going to be central to your ability to be productive and successful in your career. So hopefully now that we're beginning to dive into the profile, I've convinced you why LinkedIn is going to be a pertinent part of your career management strategy. So let's move forward into profile. Now, I do just want to say something. The animations were not working on the slide deck, so I was hoping to kind of unveil these things one at a time, so I apologize for that. But let's dive in with, uh, in, or let me say first of all, too, I have a checklist that Kathy and her team will be sending you all after this um, webinar so that you can look at that against um, what, we're, what we're talking about tonight. So you don't need to take copious notes, okay? Um, let me start by saying that LinkedIn wants all of its users to meet their terms for an all-star profile. So you see at the bottom of the screen or the bottom of the slide deck, you've kind of got this little star icon. That's their new icon that they're using. And when you look at your profile, which we will jump into LinkedIn in just a second, um, you'll be able to kind of gauge where are you at in terms of your profile strength. Now, the reason that LinkedIn wants you to have an all-star profile is because it makes you more searchable. LinkedIn says you're 27 times more likely to come in a, up in a recruiter search if you have completed all their steps for a complete profile. Obviously, that also helps them feed their revenue source of having corporate clients who are able to enjoy and cull through robust profiles with information. But what I want you to do is think about it in terms of a Google search, right, or another um, you know, search engine that you might use. When you Google something, I'm going to bet, if you're like me, you only look at the first page or maybe the first two pages of search results. So the same principle applies here. If you complete the terms for an all-star profile in LinkedIn, you will have a better chance of coming up at the top of any search results that a, com that a recruiter might do. So if they enter, for example, I want to see people in the Boston area who went to MIT Sloan, who have the word operations and supply chain in their profile. They will get a certain amount of search results, and they will be ordered by profile completion. So hopefully this helps you understand why it's important to get to this all-star profile. So first of all, first term, professional-looking photo, all right? Now, before I distract you with stunning visuals of other alums and show you profile photos that are good, let me make a couple points. I have three rules about your LinkedIn profile photo. It should be recent. It should be primarily only of your face, not even half of a body shot because the thumbnail is so small in LinkedIn, having half of your body doesn't even make sense. It really should only be from the neck up. So that's number two. And three, you should be smiling, okay? A couple years ago, or actually three years ago now, I interviewed all of the companies that recruit here on campus, and I asked them about their kind of their, their preferences with regards to LinkedIn and a resume. So when I was first really developing my LinkedIn workshops. And time and time again, I heard from recruiters that one of the reasons they prefer LinkedIn over a resume is because you're able to see a photo. 
The other thing they liked was a summary, but we're going to get to that. So with regards to that photo, I think what's important is, you know, first impressions account. And so if you look friendly, people will be more inclined to kind of want to talk to you, right? So people hire people who look nice, basically. So that, that photo, I think, is a really key visual for people to see. Now, I've already, you've already seen number two here in terms of our all-star profile is the headline, and that comes right under the picture. We're about to jump in and look at a couple of um, headlines right now. As you see here, most people use their job title, going back to the notion that passive talent is really the, the bulk of LinkedIn membership. Most people have their job title. I have my job title. Um, or they might create a slogan, something a little more um, catchy that, that talks about their unique value proposition. Or there's an opportunity to just use keywords and separate them by an up and down line called a pipe. We'll look at each of those. So let's jump over. Whoops. Looking. All right. So this is a screenshot of two alums. I want to point out, first of all, excellent profile pictures. They fit all of my criteria, recent, face only, and smiling, or, you know, just looking friendly. Now, in terms of our headline, Elizabeth Patheo has senior manager with expertise in global strategy and operations. Oftentimes, if I'm working with alums who want to craft or use this slogan headline, that is kind of the formula I'll give them. So define who you are, you know, product manager, with expertise in X and Y, or with success in X and Y, if that feels better to you. So that's a nice um, template you might want to take away. You could get a little more creative. If we look at Erica's slogan, hers reads, healthcare executive, creative thinker, and process tinkerer with a penchant for patient excellence. So it's a little bit more interesting in that it adds a little character, a little personality. Some might find it interesting. I would say that it might even uh, make you inclined to click in and learn a little bit more about Erica. So this is, a slow, this is the slogan kind of way to go. I did want to share some other slogans with alums with whom I've worked. I've got them right here. So big idea marketer with success in launching startups is one. Executive advisor and investor in sustainable infrastructure and technology. Leveraging data and analytics to grow revenue, create partnerships, and improve the customer experience. So I don't know how these land with you. Everybody's different. I would not recommend that you use this if it doesn't feel right to you, but it is an option for you to consider if perhaps your job, you know, your job title doesn't really, you know, make any sense for someone who doesn't know your company or your position. So it is an, an option. Now, going to my next um, suggestion is using just a keyword with the pipe. Now, for those of you who don't know where to find that pipe, if you look at the Enter key on your keyboard, the, the um, key just above that will have a straight up and down line. So that's where you can make your pipe. Now, Faluso, honestly, to be honest, I would have loved to have that last. He's got emerging market split and market stands alone on the second line. I don't love that. I, I think the, the keyword to be most effective, you should just keep it all in one line. Um, but this is another option, you know, especially with some people who culturally the idea of having like a catchy slogan just does not do anything for them. This is a much more straightforward approach. You're basically thinking about your core competencies and you're listing them up at the top. So another way to get, you know, kind of inspiration for these, sometimes I'll tell people, look at job descriptions. Job descriptions of a job you have or you want, kind of what are the competencies being called out. If you have those, you might consider putting those in your headline. The bottom line with headline is that it is an important piece of real estate, right, because it is at the top. You're going to see it. Um, so it is important to give some thought to. Now, as I say this, I just got an email from LinkedIn today at 1.30 saying that in the coming weeks, and I don't know if any of you have seen this yet, they are rolling out a new <laughs> profile look where the, the tiny little um, picture that you see in the middle of the screen is going to be moved to the left, and they're going to bring up some other, you know, some other features like your school 
and your current workplace that's going to be defined more on the right. So that's going to look interesting, um, but at the same time, I still think the headline will be important. All right, so now what I'm going to do to cover kind of the next part of the term for your profile is I'm going to hop into LinkedIn. There's six more items. So just give me a second here while I tee that up. All right. So I hope you can all see my screen. And I'll ask the WebEx part, Tyler to tell me if that is not happening. So you're looking at my LinkedIn profile, okay, because I can, I can get in and edit it. Um, we talked about photo. As you see, I've got a smiling, mostly face, somewhat recent photo. Um, also the headline. I have my job title, but I also used that pipe, and I kind of said, in essence, I'm, I have this title, but what I am is a career coach. The other two things that you need to have to meet the terms for a complete profile are your industry and your location. So let's take a look at how you fix those. You will log into your profile, as I'm doing now, and you'll see this edit button, this little pencil icon. So you want to click on that, and you can see the things that appear in the top part of your profile. Position, education, and you can also edit those in the sections, because it'll say, you know, we can go to these different sections. But if you keep scrolling down, we'll start first with location. You'll come to this, where it'll say your country or your region, it will ask you for your zip code, and then it will pull up a location that you will select. Now, my zip code is in Reading, Massachusetts, which is a tiny little New England town of 26,000 people. I don't want my location to say that. I want to pick the bigger metropolitan area that is near where I live. So for those of you who have kind of the tiny town where you live, or even, you know, I see people with Cambridge, Massachusetts all the time, I will tell them, switch your location to the greater Boston area. Because again, if you're thinking about the companies who use LinkedIn's sourcing tools or talent solutions, when they're looking at certain geographic locations, they're typically looking at the larger metropolitan area when they put in their search criteria. So really important. The next thing that you can do that well, up here in this part that is part of the terms for the complete profile is to choose an industry. So there are 167 industries offered. So you click on here. Obviously, for me, it makes the most sense, higher education. There are a ton of other industries. Take a look. Choose whatever seems best for you. You would choose the industry that you're currently in. If you are intentionally trying to switch industries, then I would recommend you put your preferred industry, the one you're trying to pivot into or change into, and then you're going to make a case for that in the summary. So we'll talk about that. And, you know, to that point, the same thing goes with location. So if, you know, if you know that in two months you will be moving to London and you're going to be looking for a role in London, you know, I would go ahead and change your location to your destination or to your preferred location because that will also enable you to come up in recruiter searches for that location or for that industry. All right, I'm just going to take a sip of water because I'm talking a lot with my MIT mug. All right, next um, term for the complete profile is summary. So I'm going to pop out of here. We're going to look at some other summaries. Now, the one thing I want to say about summary is, as I mentioned, LinkedIn is a platform for storytelling. So what I advise alumni to do is write their summary in the first person. You'll just see a little bit. I'm not going to showcase mine, but I've kind of begun to use that formula that I shared with you last month in our first webinar around your career narrative. Your career narrative should have three components. It should address who you are, what you do well, and what you're looking to do next and why, if you are indeed job searching. If you're not, it, I would say something around, you know, kind of what motivates you in your work or what you um, are best suited for uh, in terms of your work. Um, so the first person voice is one of those things that differentiates your LinkedIn from your resume. Resume, strictly third person. LinkedIn, if you want to optimize it, it should be considered a platform for storytelling, and your summary is a key part of that. 
going back to what I said about pulling the recruiters that come to MIT Sloan and recruit on campus and about their, um, their preferences with regards to LinkedIn, the picture and the summary, I actually had someone say to me, if there's a good summary, I will keep scrolling through that profile. And I think that's really important because not a lot of people on LinkedIn actually have a summary. And if they do, it's that cut and paste from their resume, it's in a third person. It's almost like an objective statement. Not really compelling to read. So let's take a look now at a few um, MIT Sloan alums whose summaries I have, or who have written their own summaries um, through my work with them. I did, and just also a note, last month I showcased three other summaries. I'm not using them this week. I wanted to give you new and fresh. So with Last month and this month, you'll have a nice array of summaries to look at. So the first one is Nabil Lalji. Nabil used my formula for the headline, right? Design strategist with expertise in lean entrepreneurship. Let me read his summary to you because I think it's hard for me to ask you to read it yourself. So an MBA by trade and an anthropologist and educa educator at heart, I draw on design thinking and lean startup to help companies uncover user needs and quickly develop solutions their customers will fall in love with. My work has spanned the gamut and the globe, from helping a Fortune 100 telecom dive deep into the lives of gamers to identify what services it can build for them, to coaching software executives in Singapore on how to facilitate mind-blowing strategy sessions, to prototyping a smart podcast service that helps users cut through their reader backlog or their reading backlog. I excel at facilitating groups, uncovering customers' deep-seated needs, and enabling teams to develop products that sit at that sweet spot of desirable, viable, and feasible. I didn't know those were proper nouns, but now I do. Having personally coached between 750 and 1,000 professionals, today I equip executives to do the same at companies such as Accenture, Autodesk, Honeywell, and Cisco. After five years of running my own design strategy practice, I'm ready to scale up my impact by joining a company that is growing quickly, has a strong team culture, and cares deeply about delighting its users. I am actively seeking opportunities to leverage my expertise in design thinking, lean startup, and financial analysis, and bring to bear my work ethic, curiosity, patience, and terrible puns to link arms and build something great. Okay, so I'll let that sink in. A few things. You might be thinking, it's a little long. It might be a little long. That's probably as long as I'd suggest your, your summary go. Um, but, you know, you get a sense of Nabil and the work he has done. He has answered all those questions I mentioned. Who are you? What do you do well? What are you looking to do next and why? And for those of you who are actively job seeking, I want you to pay close attention to his last paragraph because that is what recruiters want to see. They want to see what do you want to do? Where are you looking to add value? Okay? Don't make them figure it out. Tell them where you want to be. Uh, so I cannot emphasize this enough. It is really going to help move the needle in terms of your getting taps or you're getting, rec you know, kind of some responses to your profile. And in fact, I do want to tell you that the week after Nabil changed his summary, he was contacted by a company. The guy who called him said, you know what, I like terrible puns too. So this guy had been reading through LinkedIn profiles and called him because he kind of got that, he liked, he liked what he read, and just this adding that terrible pun thing actually got him on the radar of a recruiter. Um, I've seen that happen before. I think I shared last month with Michael Donahue how he had a great response to his, his LinkedIn summary soon after he did it. So that's one thing to consider. Let's take a look at another. A little shorter, a little different. We're going to look at Olga Lindenko, who is right here. Okay. All right, she's at Akamai. And she used to be a C-suite leader, which is what she's trying to say in her first sentence. So let me just, I'll read it to you. I belong to the 5% of senior leaders in the U.S., the female executives. Born and raised in Ukraine, I've always had a passion for software technology and innovation. I'm an entrepreneurial leader who enjoys transforming the organizations and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. 
Within the last years, I've had a, pr a privilege of scaling the operations of a 200-plus people team, driving continuous revenue growth globally. I bring leadership expertise in SaaS, B2B technology strategy, operations, sales, marketing, and business development. I excel at solving complex business problems through business innovation, optimization, and automation. I'm a natural facilitator and use every opportunity to drive collaboration and teamwork across leadership, employees, and other stakeholders. My value add is cross-discipline management, scaling process and data-driven operations from ground up, as well as principled leadership. If this is something that interests you, let's talk. So a little different take. Um, take from it what you will. What I would have loved to see there is perhaps a tangible example of how she's applied some of these skills that she's claiming to have. Um, but nevertheless, this worked for her. She actually ended up moving to Akamai um, not long ago, just a few months ago, and I don't think she's updated her summary yet, but wanted to show you a little bit um, shorter summary. And then last, I'm going to show Nelson. Nelson is actually a doctor and got his MBA through our EMBA program. Is he EMBA? Yeah, EMBA 2016. So I, his will be the last one I'll show, and then we'll keep going. As a pediatric cardiologist and business executive, I focused my career on optimizing performance, delivering value, and achieving desired outcomes. I bring 15 plus years of healthcare, business, and technology experience, and I'm dedicated to being a change agent in how we deliver healthcare in the modern era. By leveraging my years of patient care, I can translate clinical workflows and healthcare challenges into business opportunities to meet the demands of the healthcare industry. My focus on systematic change and process-driven outcomes has been recognized, as well as my ability to educate and transfer knowledge effectively. I'm comfortable communicating with executives, clinicians, consumers, and large audiences. I serve on the board of directors for Blue Dragon Children's Foundation, a nonprofit that rec rescues and improves the welfare of street children in Vietnam. Um, so Nelson is not looking for a job. He is considered passive talent. He's got a role that he's happy in. Um, so, but this is just another way to show that even if you're not looking, you don't have to say any, you know, you can just kind of talk about yourself. It doesn't have to be um, you know, using those keywords like Nabil did, saying I'm actively seeking opportunities. Although if you are actively seeking opportunities, I do recommend that you use, you use um, those words because those are considered kind of the buzzwords that recruiters look at when they're looking to hire just-in-time talent. Um, but if you're not, you can just have kind of who you are and what you do well, and you don't have to get into that third part of the narrative, which is what you're looking to do next in line, okay? So I hope that helps with the summaries. In a webinar, it's always different because I can't get any of your feedback. In my live workshops, I think this often is, a, is something to be discussed because people have a lot of opinions about different summaries. And there's really no perfect summary. I think if I could give you any um, advice about the summary, it would be that, you know, if I'm telling you it's an, it should be in first person and that feels just authentically wrong and does not at all resonate with you, then don't do it. The summary should be a genuine reflection of yourself. It should be conversational yet professional in tone. But there's very different types of people. And so, you know, I've had people who work on Wall Street say to me, there's no way I'm going to write a first-person summary. Right? Whereas I've had people in Silicon Valley say, great, I'm getting tons of traction from it. So it really should be a reflection of who you are as a professional, what feels right to you in terms of length. You know, I think I've read, I read a really long one to start. It was probably the most comprehensive of these examples that I shared, but it could be long. So, you know, whatever works for you, there's no, like, hard or fast rules about the summary. All right, to keep moving through these um, terms, we're going to go now to work experience, and I'm going to show another profile. This is Susan Bankston. So Susan, I'm going to showcase her work experience section. So the one thing I want to say about work experience, to meet LinkedIn's terms of having a complete profile, you want to have a current position and two prior positions. And when you enter your work experience, make sure, if possible, that you have the logo. So she, you see she worked at Apple for five years the logos of the companies where you used to work or where you currently work. It adds a nice visual to the work experience section. section. And then if for some reason people don't know what, you know, um, this company is, L Brands, you could click on it and find out more. So you don't have to waste real estate explaining what the company is. You want to get quickly to your role. 
Now, I'm going to just stay down here for a minute. So, so um, after her MBA, and Susan was actually an LGO, so she got both her master's in engineering as well as her MBA. So she was part of our Leaders for Global Operations program. Um, after she graduated, she went to Victoria's Secret and then um, moved on to L Brands, which owns Victoria's Secret. When you are talking about your work experience, I also recommend that you continue the, the first person voice to optimize your profile. Now, if that's too much for you, then just cut and paste the bullets from your resume. Not ideal, not optimal, but better than nothing because you're at least getting keywords in your profile. But if you do want to take the time to craft an optimized LinkedIn profile, I would recommend that you go and revisit your work experience and you write it in a first person voice. It's a lot easier to easier to read, it's more readable, more interesting to read if it's first person. And make sure, like your resume, that the content of what you put under your work experience is focused on results and impact. So I always tell people, it doesn't matter if you have experience doing something, just because you have experience doesn't mean you do it well. So don't talk about what you do, talk about what you do well. So in an effort to just kind of read something short and concise, I'm kind of going to Susan's earlier work experience. But for example, at um, Limited Brands here as the Senior Supply Chain Analyst, she wrote, I spearheaded a Lean Six Sigma effort to improvise a made to, oh, sorry, to improve a major process at the Victoria's Secret Direct Distribution Center. In addition, I devised a distribution strategy to facilitate growth of Victoria's Secret's direct, direct international customer base. Finally, I scoped potential origin-based logistics capabilities and provided recommendations to senior management. Short, concise, she was there for less than a year. When you get, you know, when you're somewhere longer, so for example, she was at Apple in a worldwide planner for four years, then she moved, she changed, it was a little different. Um, she became a, a regional planner. Um, she's broken out those two roles in different and talked about them differently. So um, I won't read this whole thing, but just to give you a flavor of how she's talking about it. As the sole iMac allocator, I forecasted demand and allocated six models comprising the iMac product lineup across Apple's sales channels and geographies weekly. On top of my product line responsibilities, I was selected from among four allocators to lead the quarter and inventory process for the entire Mac team, including preparation for daily executive reviews. During my tenure, I successfully launched three individual Macs, she has the dates, and oversaw the launch of the entire iMac lineup. I'm going to stop reading here. But you get the idea. She's not talking about what she did well. She's talking about what she, uh, no, she is talking about what she did well. I successfully launched three, you know, three individual iMacs. So it's a lot easier when you talk in the first person because instead of saying, for example, like on your resume, you might say let lead team of 10, right, or lead team of 10 to do X, Y, Z. When you're talking in first person, you can say, I work with a high-performing team that is doing X, Y, Z. So think about trying to shift the narrative, right, the story, when you are talking about your work experience. Moving on, getting down to the last few things of your profile and the all-star profile requirements, is your education section. So I'll stick with um, Susan's profile here. Now again, I mentioned she got both her master's degree from MIT and MIT Sloan, so wisely she has used both schools in her education section. Uh, because people might search for, I just want to see people who graduated from MIT, or people might be looking at MIT Sloan, so she's got both. Now, the big thing to know here under the education section, just like the work experience, you want to make sure that you've got that nice clean visual because it does add a, a more attractive, appealing look to your profile. So link your, your school to your profile, just like you'll link your company to your profile. And then if you want, you know, again, she hasn't done this, uh, or maybe she did here under her MIT Sloan piece. Um, you can talk in the first person voice. So Susan's got part of a four student team who did a semester long project for Nike revolving around lean manufacturing. I represented the team for one week of meetings with Nike management in Vietnam and had the opportunity to tour one of their factories. So, you know, you don't have to put a lot of content under here. The longer you're out of school, the less relevant it is. You don't have to put any contact on con or any content. Maybe, of course, just your um, your area of study or focus. But you can add, you know, activities and societies you were part of, or other things that might be 
interesting and relevant to your target with regards to education. All right, so moving on, for our last term in the All-Star requirements, I'm actually going to go back to my profile because I want to show you how to edit it. And the last term is having at least five skills on your profile. So if we scroll down, past experience, past education, and other fields I have, you're going to have a skills and endorsement section. Now let me just tee this up by saying this section is was created to help kind of generate that the the, the consumer or the client base that, that LinkedIn has. So the idea is you select skills you have, and you're able to select up to 50 skills. You then have your connections endorse you for skills, thereby, you know, kind of giving credibility to the fact that you do indeed have that skill. Now, typically in my workshops, I'll say, how many of you have been endorsed by people and you know they have no idea that you actually have this skill? And of course, everybody raises their hands, and that's because it has become kind of this game. But it is a game you have to play. Uh, LinkedIn says on their website, 14 billion endorsements have been given. They're certainly not going to go away anytime soon. So I would suggest that you do take some time to curate your skills in this section. To meet LinkedIn's terms for having a complete profile, you want to have at least five skills. Now, you get up to 50, I think that's way too much. I would recommend having no more than like 15 or so. I've got 14 on my profile, as you see here. Let me show you quickly how to edit those skills. So, you're going to go into the pencil icon. Now, LinkedIn just changed this feature this week. What they've done now is they've given you three skills that you can pin at the top, and that will be like your featured skills when you look at this section. And pretty much the way they picked that, I think, is by the, the number of endorsements you have for skills. So, you know, if I wanted to take off career counseling and put higher education, I could do that. And if I wanted higher education to be at the top rather than the bottom, I could move it up. That's basically the point of this. Um, of this. Um, they've also bucketed skills into kind of categories. So you've got your top skills, industry knowledge. There's one called tools and technologies, which I don't have on my uh, profile. Then there's interpersonal skills and other skills. So if you want to order your skills, delete your skills with the trash can icon, or move your skills around, this is where you do it. The last thing I'll point out on this page is there is the opportunity to, inject, to adjust your endorsement settings. The bottom line is if you have any runway left on your career, I would just put all of these to yes, which essentially means I'll get endorsed for, I want to be endorsed for a skill. You can include me in endorsement suggestions to my connections, which thankfully they have stopped doing. They used to do that quite a bit a while ago. And then show me suggestions to endorse my connections. I would just recommend that you hit yes. So take some time. I'm betting most people, if you even have a skill section, probably have like 50 skills, some of them that don't even make sense for you. So in the interest of optimizing your profile, go through there, and I'd encourage you to cut them down to like 5 to 15 skills. And that's all I'm going to say about the skill section because it's really not critical, okay? Now, I was going to jump back to the um, – PowerPoint here, because we are coming up on the end, and I just want to kind of fly through a few more slides. So we have now covered all the terms for an all-star profile, okay? So you'll have that slide deck to go back to. I want to end with just a few more tips for profile um, additions that I highly recommend you do. And I'll just do the three. They all appear here because I don't have my animation. but. Um, the first thing I want you to do is customize your LinkedIn URL. Some of you may be saying, I have no idea what that means. So let me now jump back in to LinkedIn. Okay. To customize your LinkedIn URL, you're going to go to your profile. On the top right-hand section here, you're going to see this box that says Edit Public Profile and URL. That's actually going to open up a second, a separate page. What this is, is what you will see or what a user might see if they 
Google your name and they're not logged into LinkedIn. So you want to set these settings. You also want to edit your URL here. This top piece right here, it says personalize the URL for your profile. If most of you go there, you'll probably realize when you look at this, it will say your name and it'll have a bunch of letters and characters and symbols after it. You just want to edit your profile and pick five to 30 letters or numbers and create for yourself a nice clean link. So I have my name, Brenton A. Burkhart. This nice clean link, oh, by the way, it also says do not use spaces, symbols, or special characters, but you can actually use the dash. So if you want to use like first name, dash, last name, it will allow you to do that. You used to not do it, but you can do it now. So that's where you're gonna to wanna to customize your URL. Now, the importance of doing this is a, kind of numerous. So first of all, you're going to increase your search engine optimization, which means your LinkedIn profile will appear at the top of search results if people Google you or use another search engine. Next, take that nice clean URL and put it in your email signature once your profile is optimized. You can also put it on your resume. Nobody's putting physical address on resume anymore. It's email address, phone, and LinkedIn URL because the world has changed and people are looking at LinkedIn in addition to your resume. So that's the importance here. I don't have time to cover this other piece, but I would take a look at this page when you're editing your, or when you're customizing your, your URL and just kind of take a look at what you might want visible to those who want to see your LinkedIn profile but are not logged into LinkedIn. The other things I want to cover are your contact info. So again, I'm on my profile, now I have to kind of scroll down here and I go to contact and personal info. You're gonna to wanna to edit that. I'm not gonna click into it because I wanna move a little quickly. You are able to add websites. You are able to add a Twitter account. You're able to add your email, your phone number, um, things that are important to you. This is really important, especially if you created your LinkedIn profile in 2005 and you still have an old phone number or a Hotmail address or something that needs to be updated. So if you want people to be able to get in touch with you, you wanna make sure that your contact and your personal info is up to date. And then the last piece of optimizing your profile, and then I'm gonna to go to questions, is making sure that you do add other profile sections that are relevant to you and your target. And when I say target, if you're not job seeking, then um, this might not make sense, but it is, or it might not make sense for you, but you do just want to think about what is relevant for someone to know about you and the professional brand that you want to have now at this age and stage. So, there are different profile sections. There's the background section, and we've covered that. It's having your work experience and your education. There's also the opportunity to have volunteer experience on your profile. So take a look at that, too. Sometimes it's nice to show you more as a well-rounded professional and give a sense of your interest. Again, I would recommend that you take your volunteer experience and you write that in the first person. We've, we've also talked about skills. Um, so we've talked about how to add the skills section. I've got 14. It wants me to add more, but I'm not going to. And then lastly is the accomplishment section. And that is a ton of other fields that you might want to add if they are relevant to your target. So publications or certifications. So like I'm MBTI certified and I've got my StrengthsFinder certification and that's relevant to my field. So I've got those search certific certificates on my profile. If you have patents, only if they're relevant. If you no longer want to work in that world, you don't necessarily have to have every single patent on your profile. Courses, that's helpful for people who are typically coming just out of college. That's their LinkedIn's biggest growing demographic is college graduates. And so without work experience, they need to use these fields to kind of show what they have uh, to bring to bear. So courses, projects, honors and awards, test scores, obviously, not probably not relevant for an alumni audience um, unless you're just fresh out of school. And then languages, which can be really nice um, to kind of show your, your skill set. And organizations might be professional organizations that you belong to. So those are the profile sections that I would encourage you to take a look at and add. But remember, you want your profile to be scrollable. You don't want to be, you know, packing it with tons of info. People will not read it. It should be clean, concise, compelling, okay? So, once again, we kind of get up against our time limit here. Um, that is what you want to have for a complete profile and those other things that I recommend that you use to highly optimize your profile. 
You also might want to consider, I'm just going to do this because it's on my profile, adding rich media. So as you see here, I've got two of my workshops. One is my old LinkedIn workshop, which is much longer than this one. So if you feel like you need more and want to take a look at that, you can get it off my profile. Um, but having video clips, PowerPoint, SlideShare, those can sometimes add a nice visual component and add some credibility to your profile and give more of a portfolio feel to it. All right, that is how to optimize your profile. I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy. I know we're coming up on just seven more minutes. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you're feeling a little more confident about LinkedIn, and I will look forward to our next uh, career webinar in June on compensation conversations. Thank you, Bryn. That's so, great. I think it's a lot. Yes, it's a lot, but you did a great job in sharing some really terrific um, tips for people. So um, thank you very much. And um, so let me quickly just make some uh, announcements to let people know about some upcoming uh, other MIT Sloan alumni online um, uh, programs that we have. Let me advance. Um, so we have our part three in our career series in June um, with you, and then we have a couple of other um, we have a couple of other uh, programs coming up uh, as well in May and July, and um, those will be available online for people to log in and learn about those. Um, we also have a couple of events coming up worldwide. So we have, uh, of course, reunion back here in June, and we have our conference in New York City uh, later this month um, on the future of work, the digital economy. Um, and we have some questions. So uh, let me start with Gail um, Tamita Oswald, who is in LA, and asks, um, in what circumstances would LinkedIn Premium be most helpful or valuable? Okay, so, you know, I actually have a slide on that, so I'm going to make sure that's included in the deck that you get sent when you get the final PDF. Um, you know, I would keep, well, first of all, LinkedIn is trying to get everybody to pay a premium subscription. Before you do that, take the time to do what I've recommended you do tonight and optimize your profile so that when you, if you want to go to a premium subscription, and I would recommend you take advantage, they offer you a free month to get started. So you take advantage of that free month and see if it works for you. Um, but do that before you, before you go to a premium. The advantages of a premium membership are essentially this. You get increased search filters if you're using the job board. You are able to see who has viewed your profile up to 90 days, so a whole other section I did not get to this evening was the privacy settings. You are able to see who's looked at your profile. If you are on a free account, you cannot see this, or you can only you can see it up to seven days if people have chosen to allow their, their identity to be shown. So you get to control, you as a user get to say, if I'm looking at somebody else's profile, do I want to appear like Brent and A. Burkhart? or do I want to appear anonymous, or do I want to appear semi-anonymous? Um, if you are fully open and sharing your name, you will be able to see who else has looked at your profile up to seven days. With a premium subscription, it's 90 days. Why is that important? Because if you are job seeking, this is part of how you're going to know if you're getting traction, because you're going to use LinkedIn to conduct a network job search, and that's probably a part two we should plan for the future, Kathy, because um, that is, that's important. And then the last reason a premium membership might be valuable is you are able to view unlimited amounts of LinkedIn profiles each month. So um, if you are a free user and you start looking at a lot of different LinkedIn profiles, you're going to get blocked at a certain point, and then it will refresh for the next month. They don't give you a number of profiles you can look at. They'll just say, you've reached your free commercial use. Um, you can't look at any more profiles. If you want to look at more profiles, buy premium. So those are the three things, um, being able to see who's looked at your profile, having advanced search filters, and having unlimited use of looking at profiles. Great, thank you. We have um, two more questions, and um, one um, has been asked by a number of our, our live audience um, members, and the next one um, that we have is a spotlight question I also want to share, which is um, Jeff Wickham um, in Wellesley asked, 
Some people advocate making as many connections on LinkedIn as possible. Others recommend a balance of quality and quantity. Um, what do you say and why? And I, I think you started to address this in your presentation, but um, if you can answer yeah. that, then we still have one more and two minutes okay. to go. I'll try and be quick. <laughs> Bottom line, I would only recommend that you connect with people that you know and that you trust. I would not recommend connecting with as many people as possible. There are people who like that, and that kind of works for them. Here's why I say go with the quality versus quantity. Because if you are connected to people that you know and trust, that means you will be able to leverage your network. You can go to those people and say, hey, I'm looking to talk to somebody who's doing this type of work. And I see that you're connected to someone who could possibly help me with my exploration or my, my informational interviews. Would you be willing to tee up an introduction? So the first degree network, should, if they're all people that you know and trust, then you're able to leverage your second degree connection, which are the connections of your connections. If you don't know who you're a first degree connection with or you don't feel comfortable asking them to do a favor for you, and vice versa, if you wouldn't feel comfortable if they asked you to do a favor for them, because you're not that, that your, your connection to them is not that strong, then in my opinion, it's useless. I can talk more about that. And I, if you watch that longer LinkedIn video I talked about, I'd go through that in more detail. Great. So um, this other question uh, people are asking about is sort of protecting their anonymity um, or, um, you know, with their current employer seeing that they are, yeah. um, you know, updating their profile and um, looking to switch roles or functions and how they can, um, you know, sort of protect that. Um. Yeah, okay. So the thing I didn't get to discuss tonight was privacy settings. So make sure that you look at the privacy settings LinkedIn offers to make sure that when you are making profile edits that they're not pushed out to your, to your network, right? So it doesn't say, you know, Bren's added education or Bren's updated her summary, right? So make sure that your profile changes will not be shared with your network. That is a privacy setting. There's the tiny little icon of your picture at the top menu bar, which you probably saw, hopefully, when you saw it when, when I was logged into LinkedIn. If you, you go click on that, you'll get a drop down for privacy settings. Take a look at that. Especially with all that's going on in, with social media and privacy, they have really put together a long, robust list of settings for you to take a look at. So that is something I recommend you dive into. Um, in terms of how you handle your profile and how to position yourself on your profile, you know, unlike Nabil's summary that I said, that where he said, you know, I'm actively seeking new opportunities. You don't want to say that if you're doing a confidential job search, but you can kind of. Um, subtly, subtle, subtly um, tweak your profile to indicate that you might be open to opportunities with things like the work I'm ideally suited to or um, what at most, where I'm at my best is. That might be a nice way to kind of round out your summary. Remember, as I said, most people on LinkedIn are considered passive talent and that can work for them. You know, passive talent is considered talent that's not necessarily looking, so it might even be more interesting. So don't worry about having to explicitly say that you're looking. But you should, I would take good care to craft a LinkedIn summary that positions you for the role which you are seeking. Well, that was great. That was great, Bryn. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that we do have to wrap up, but I want to thank you for another terrific career-focused program and thank everyone for joining us as well. Um, to keep this conversation going uh, on social media, please use the hashtag, Slo the hashtag Sloney Chat. And we will um, be able to, uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for our next MIT Sloan Alumni Online event made uh, possible in part by the Sloan Annual Fund. Thank you to everyone Thank for joining you. us. Thank you, Bryn. Sure.